who is joining the meeting from his home. We have Mr. Bill Cox, District 4 Supervisor. He is joining us from the conference room here in the Village Building. We have Mrs. Karen Carmack from District 5. She's calling in from her place of work, Maslow Wood Products. We have up here on stage with me to my left is Mr. Larry Norvick, District 2. And to my right, Mr. Mike Byerly, District 3. Also in attendance remotely, we have Mr. Tom Lachney, the County Attorney. We'll be introducing others as we go through the evening. Our first order of business is to approve the agenda. But first, do we have any request to postpone, change the agenda as presented? If not, I'm gonna recommend approval. Uh, one concern on the meeting minutes of January 27th. This is the emergency meeting. The regular meeting oh, follows. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. <clears throat> As I've made the motion for the approval of the agenda as presented, do I have a second? Second. Any comments on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a formal approval of the agenda. New business, we have resolution 2020-23, a resolution for ratification of the declaration of local emergency. Mr. Chardon, would you briefly explain what that's about? Yeah, so on uh, March 15th, uh, Phil Warner and myself is the uh, director and deputy director of emergency management during this. Um, <clears throat> we issued the local emergency declaration and the board needs to ratify that within 45 days. Uh, so that's what's here before you. Primarily, the local declaration allows us to um, loosen up some procurement guidelines in case we need to get things like PPE, sanitizer, uh, cleaning services, things like that. Uh, so far, we haven't had to um, use much in that regard, but it is in place in case we need it. Uh, and also, it helps us for reimbursement from state and federal aid later uh, when some of the costs of responding to the pandemic will be uh, reimbursable by them. Uh, we have a resolution prepared when we're ready to lift the emergency ordinance. Um, so we'll, we'll know when we're ready to do that. Um, certainly um, not there yet, but we do have that ready as well. So we'll come back to the board to formally uh, end this local emergency ordinance later. Okay. Ms. Sharnan, I'm having a hard time hearing you, so I don't know whether it's us or whether it's at your location, but uh, if you could speak up, it would be helpful. Yeah, uh, uh, I'll speak up. Is that better? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, any questions from Ms. Sharnan, board? I have a comment. Mr. Norbert. Ready. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I had something else in mind, but I'm, I just want this to be a reminder to my colleagues and to the public. Um, we're talking about big medicine here. Declaring an emergency <clears throat> is pretty much the biggest hammer that a government can drop, uh, at least other than in time of war. So I just want as a reminder to the colleagues, to staff, um, believe it or not, even at the local level, we have police powers and we have to be very careful to balance the power that is given us um, and we have to use it wisely. We have to balance that with uh, our charge for public health and safety. So I'm just going to read a couple things uh, everybody's going to be familiar with. One is from the First Amendment, one is from the Fifth Amendment, and um, I'm going to kind of leave it right there on the table for people to be reminded of. So in the First Amendment, it says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. And obviously um, we bump up against um, some of the things that are handed down to us, both from the federal and the state level and things that we're expected to enforce at the local level. And I would um, prayerfully consider, or I would encourage the board to prayerfully consider where is that line? Uh, where is that balance that we wanna strike? 
Um, I'm not preaching. I'm not telling anybody what to do. It's just a reminder. And in the Fifth Amendment also, um, uh, you uh, citizens shall not be compelled um, in any criminal case to be a witness against himself nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So keep in mind those things, if you would. Um, some of that's encapsulated in the Declaration, but the First Amendment and the Fifth Amendment, I thought, were particularly applicable. And uh, most people have heard that before, but I think it's appropriate for us to be reminded of these things so that we don't step on civil liberties without a uh, just cause and a very, very good reason. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Norvick. Um, was my motion seconded? Did you second the motion, Mr. Byling? No, I did not. Okay, so you have seconded my motion. Okay, any further discussion on the motion? If not, I'm gonna ask Mr. Shardine to call the roll. Right. Mr. Norvig? Aye. Mr. Byerly? Aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. Mrs. Carmack? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Motion passed. <clears throat> we'll move on to the adoption of the emergency continuity of operations ordinance pursuant to Virginia Code 15.2-1413. Again, uh, Mr. Chardon, would you provide us with some background? Yeah, so the uh, state law of Virginia that allows you uh, boards to meet remotely um, to address <clears throat> the emergency directly, uh, but to do other county business not related to the emergency, such as passing a budget, uh, things of that nature, you have to adopt a similar ordinance to this one. Uh, so essentially this provides that allowance for you to hold meetings remotely. Um, and the reason for us is meeting in person with the staff required to run the meeting, the full board, um, and, and the public, it would be almost impossible to comply with any of the federal or state guidelines for distancing, number of persons, all of that. Um, so for that reason, that's why we're having this in place so we can meet remotely. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Chardin? I'm again going to make the motion for approval of the ordinance that's before us tonight. Do I have a second? Second. Any comments on the motion? Mr. Chardin, would you call the roll again? Mr. Nordvig? Aye. Mr. Byerly? Aye. Mr. Cox? Aye. Mrs. Carmack? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. And with that, I'm going to adjourn the emergency. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman? Yes. If I could real quick, Tom Lashley, County Attorney. Yes. Just for everybody's information, you're going to see this again because we've adopted it as an emergency, but under state law, we'll, within 60 days, it'll have to be on another agenda with the public hearing and a ratification. So just so everybody understands why are, you, why are we seeing this again, this will be on a subsequent agenda because whenever it's adopted as an emergency motion, we will have to subsequently put it on another agenda after it's advertised. Good information, Tom. Thank you. Again, with that sharing, I'm going to close the emergency meeting. I now call to order a regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Supervisors dated March 30th, 2020. Again, I would like to identify those that are participating. On stage tonight, to my right is Mr. Barley, District Three supervisor to my left is Mr. Norvik, District Two supervisor. Um, joining us remotely from the conference room in the Village Building is Mr. Cox, District Four supervisor. And last, joining us from her place of business work, Marsla Wood Products, is Mrs. Karen Carmack, District Five supervisor. And we a also quick correction, David. I'm actually at home. I don't know if it matters, but I, I couldn't, my computer at work didn't work. So I, I'm at home. I don't, just to, for the okay. record. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carmack. <clears throat> um, also join us is our interim acting county administrator, Mr. Brett Chardon, 
and our county attorney, Mr. Tom Lashney, and we'll have others that are on the agenda tonight that will be joining us remotely. Um, at this time, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Barley to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and Mr. Norvick to do the invocation for us. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Lord, uh, this is the invocation. We are invoking your presence with us. We know you always see and you always hear. Um, but in a special way, we, we would pray that you would be with us tonight while we deliberate these very important things. Um, you spoke and the, the universe leapt into existence with a word, you created all things. Uh, you know about this virus to you, it's, it's like a little grasshopper, it's a nothing. But to us, it's a big thing, um, but you're bigger and we recognize that. So we pray for your grace um, that you would help us through this trial that we would come out better and closer to you and uh, keep us safe, keep us healthy, keep our first responders healthy and just bless Powhatan County. Amen. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you gentlemen. Do I have any request to postpone agenda items, additions, deletions or changes to the order of presentation tonight? Mr. Chairman, may I try this again? Yes, sir. Um, on the consent agenda, a well, let's wait till we get to the consent agenda mm -hmm. because you know that's a separate item. Okay. Okay. You want to wait for that? You don't want to change the order of the consent agenda. You want to correct something that's in the consent agenda. Yes, Is that sir. correct? That's correct. So you will be making a motion to pull something off for discussion. Right. And a recommendation for a change. Uh, again, any requests for changes, additions, deletions? If not, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Do I have a second? Yes, sir. Mr. Norvig, any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Uh, tonight we will have our presentations and we appreciate everybody that's participating tonight because this is great information at a timely point and what's going on today for you to be here and to share that information with the citizens here in Powhatan County. Uh, so at this time, I would like to present Dr. Alexander Samuel. He's the director of the Chesterfield Health District. Welcome, Dr. Samuel. Good evening, members of the board. <clears throat> I trust you can hear me okay? Yes. <clears throat> so I, I do truly thank you for this opportunity to provide you a brief update on the COVID-19 situation. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not able to be there in person this evening. Um, and just by way of reminder, uh, for, the, for those listening, the Chesterfield Health District is comprised of Powhatan County, Chesterfield County and the city of Colonial Heights. So in terms of kind of providing a broad uh, update in terms of numbers, <clears throat> let me begin by uh, pointing out what you already know that the number of COVID-19 positive cases is rising in the Commonwealth and we're seeing daily increases in this health district. Uh, so far, most of those cases have been in Chesterfield County. However, we've begun to see cases in Powhatan County uh, with the first confirmed positive identified last week and uh, two more identified over the weekend. Um, by way of, again, broad numbers, I, I typically like to offer a global perspective and then bring it down to a local level. So I'll offer worldwide totals, uh, US totals, the totals in the Commonwealth, as well as more locally. And these numbers come from uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Virginia Department of Health. Uh, they were updated um, earlier this afternoon. So in terms of worldwide totals, we're currently seeing, uh, of course, this number is changing all the time, about 775,000 cases worldwide. Uh, with a, a total number of deaths around 37,000 individuals. In the United States, uh, about 141,000 cases. 
with 2,400 deaths. This was reported earlier today by the CDC. In the Commonwealth, our, our last update um, uh, had 100, and, uh, pardon me, 1,020 cases with 25 deaths. Here in the Chesterfield Health District, we've had a total of 24 cases. Um, no one has passed away. And in Powhatan County, there have been three cases. So just by way of offering kind of a, a sense of the trends in the greater Rich, Richmond metro area, we're certainly seeing more cases as testing is becoming more available. We do have a staff uh, on hand whose specific task is to follow up with every individual who tests positive and works to get information from them about possible places they could have become exposed to the virus. And this is an effort to find out whether there are common sources or non-common sources. And what we're seeing is the general pattern of, we simply don't know where individuals have been exposed. They don't know where they've been exposed. So the term for this that's being used is community transmission. And when we see community transmission, social distancing is kind of the blunt tool that's being used to uh, uh, slow the, the spread of disease. So we've certainly seen this recently in things like school closures, uh, the limiting of size of gatherings, limiting access to public and private spaces. And then of course today, uh, the governor's uh, stay home order was put into effect. So the, the idea behind all of this is to keep sick people away from those who are well um, in, an, in order to ultimately protect those who are most vulnerable. And these, in, these are individuals who are elderly as well as those with underlying health conditions like heart disease, diabetes, weakened immune systems and so forth. Again, without any protective measures like vaccinations or even medications, uh, which neither of which we have yet, um, the concern primarily is that our healthcare system simply doesn't have the capacity and would be quickly overwhelmed if kind of rates of disease uh, progressed without any sort of measures put into place. So therefore the whole idea of social distancing is to spread out the number of people requiring hospitalized care over time in a manner that the health system can accommodate them. So this is essentially the present, uh, the, the premise behind that term that's being used a fair amount now, which is flattening the curve. Um, I do wanna bring you up to date with regard to the testing situation, which is certainly on most people's minds. Um, and I have to admit that's probably been one of the greatest challenges uh, in this whole circumstance, particularly from a public health point of view, because Testing is integral to the work that we do to prevent spread. So we, we need to know who is positive in an effort to separate those from individuals who are well. So efforts like quarantine certainly work better if you have testing capacity. And, and since we don't, we're kind of working um, um, at, at a loss and, and sort of behind the curve on this. However, you know, I, I also have to say that testing capacity overall has been slowly improving uh, in a couple of ways, one of which is the ability to conduct tests is getting better in that there are more private labs, labs that are better. able to do testing, um, as well as some private institutions like some of our university hospitals are able to do more testing. Um, on the other side of the equation is the collection of specimens to run tests on, and, and that's improving as well in that more physicians uh, and private practices are able to do that. However, the big challenge is, is simply supplies. Um, the demand is far outstripping the available resources. So even things like testing kits, swabs in those kits, um, and then certainly the whole idea of personal protective equipment for uh, those in our healthcare system who are collecting specimens uh, is a challenge as well. Um, for, for individuals who are concerned about having COVID-19, the, the best advice currently is to contact their primary care physician or provider for evaluation. And it's in that conversation that uh, a determination can be made whether or not they truly need to be tested. 
and, and certainly we are uh, advocating for those who are symptomatic or who otherwise are at higher risk to be tested first until we have greater capacity. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll kind of bring things to a close by, by sharing some of the prevention practices that we've been uh, really trying to promote at this point in time. Um, and these are things that all of us should be doing. So they fall into uh, a couple of categories, one of which is to adhere to social distant, distancing practices that are being uh, implemented right now. Um, uh, one of which is to remain home apart from work or other essential needs. And then if you must go out to maintain that six foot distance from others, um, if you fall into the category of most vulnerable, and those are individuals who are 65 years old or older or have chronic medical conditions, the advice is to, to remain home. And, and then certainly if you are ill to remain home. Um, apart from this, there are the, the personal protective measures that have been touted all along, which, which are highly effective. And uh, I think everybody should get in the habit if they're not already doing so of washing their hands with soap and water very frequently. Avoiding close contact with individuals who are sick. And although this is very challenging to avoid touching your face because of the potential for um, spread that way. Um, the last thing I'll mention is our effort here at uh, the health district level to provide more resources for individuals who do have questions about um, this issue. And certainly uh, there, there is a lot, lot of confusion, a lot of anxiety. And so I will pass this information along um, via, via email. I believe it has already been shared, but we do now have a call line, a call center here at the, at the health district level uh, for residents of Powhatan County uh, to call in if they have questions. So we do have a general question number, uh, which is, and I'll, I'll mention it now, 804-318-8207. And then we do have a line for healthcare providers if they need specific advice or information. And that number is 804-717-6440. Uh, these lines are available from eight to 4.30, Monday through Friday. And then after hours and on weekends, the Virginia Department of Health provides a similar service. Um, and the number for that is 1-877-275-8343. And that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And again, this information can be provided to be disseminated in any way that is most convenient for those uh, who you serve. So with that, I am happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Samuel. Any questions from board members? Mr. Norvick? Thank you, Dr. Samuel. This is uh, Supervisor Larry Nordvig from District 2, um, southeast corner of Powhatan. We border Chesterfield. Uh, and can you hear me okay, doctor? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, great. Um, there's a lot of chatter anecdotally, you know, on Facebook or uh, actually somebody in Walmart and that kind of thing about the flu and how the flu is, you know, killed more people this season than COVID-19 and what's so special about this why didn't we lock down for the, the regular flu? Can you approach an answer there? Uh, I don't wanna put you on the spot or anything, sure. but why should people be more concerned? Why are we locked down? Why did we cancel schools for this virus and not the regular flu virus that also has a mortality rate to it? Right, no, that, that's a very good question. I mean, I think a couple of things come into play here that are, that are unique. I'm certainly one of which is you know, there, there is a flu vaccine that, that isn't 100% effective, but uh, at least this year, it seems to have been 50% effective. Um, the, the other issue is the potential risk of severe outcomes, again, in individuals who are more vulnerable. So for COVID-19, there is about a 10 to 20 times increase in risk of death compared to the flu. So to put that in kind of broad numbers, uh, the flu causes a death 
rate of about 1.1% overall in the population, and, and that is granted quite significant. Uh, what we have found from analyzing data from, from China and other places that COVID-19 is about 1% to possibly 2%. That number has not yet been uh, kind of settled. When the dust settles, we'll have a better sense of that. So again, it is those individuals who are most vulnerable. And right now, there simply is no kind of protective means at all. So uh, hence this whole idea of social distancing, which is a very blunt instrument, a very um, uh, extreme measure in, in, in I think everybody's opinion is primarily aimed at protecting those that group of folks. Thank you, very good answer, I appreciate that. Any other questions for Dr. Samuel? Doctor, thank you so much for taking time out to come visit with us and share information. Um, it's very helpful in a time like this. And if there's anything we can do to assist you, please don't hesitate to call on us. Sure. Thank you. I'm certainly available for, for additional questions at, at any time. We'll keep that in mind, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next on our agenda tonight is Mr. Kurt Nellis. He is our emergency management coordinator and he's gonna be giving us an update tonight. Kurt, welcome. Kurt, we're looking at a screen, but we're not hearing you. How about now? Splendid. Yes. Great. Sorry. That was my fault. No worries. Uh, what, I, what I'd what i like to do, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, is just bring you a little bit up to speed on what we're doing in, from the emergency management perspective. And if you can see, see my slide presentation, I'll just go through those slides as well. You should see a COVID-19 update slide in front of you. Yes. What Dr. Samuels described is here in this visual, and this is uh, the numbers as of this afternoon, and also just wanted to uh, display them as well as he uh, so eloquently described them. But this does give you kind of a visual depiction of what the coverage is throughout the Commonwealth and the, uh, this, uh, of the cases and the number of, of deaths uh, in the US as well as uh, in Virginia. If you'll remember, um, I've been sending out information about a thing called critical lifelines and critical lifelines uh, to me in the emergency management world is the seven critical areas that I focus my attention on to make sure that if these elements are, are in service, then government is rel in relatively good shape from emergency management perspective. And I wanted to share that uh, a couple of these items are in red as well as in yellow. Uh, the first one in red is uh, the food, water, and shelter uh, lifeline. The second one is health and medical lifeline. Uh, and in yellow is uh, safety and security and communications. I'd like to just simply uh, identify what the uh, sub-elements of each one of those that causes these to be in, in this, in this uh, uh, color. Uh, red in uh, the, the scheme indicates that the services are disrupted and that there are no that there is no plan of action or a plausible solution that has been identified. Yellow indicates that the lifeline is impacted, but a solution has been identified and a plan of action is in progress. So for safety and security, we have there are several areas that are causing it to uh, go into the yellow mode. First one being a community sense of security. Uh, the impact is that, that there's a general sense of the unknown, which is causing fear and anxiety within the, uh, the community. Um, another yellow is the emergency operations center is virtually activated with only a, a, just a limited planning function in operation. Uh, a sub element of security also is government services. Uh, government services are impacted by the limited office hours and the staff having to work from home. Uh, county offices are mostly closed and uh, some offering remote businesses or by appointment only. And then the last part of safety and security 
is uh, public schools is also in yellow, but they are closed for the remainder of the academic year and admin offices are closed. Are there any questions on safety and security? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Norvig. Uh, Kurt, this is Larry Nordvig again. Um, yes. yes, sir. So public schools, that's kind of a curious one to me because safety and security you would think goes up if we aren't having to keep a bunch of uh, students safe and secure, or is it because they're scattered throughout the county? Can you just embellish on that one a little bit? No, I, I take things out of green and go into yellow in public school areas simply because they're not operating normally. If, okay. When school is in normal operation, it would be green, but uh, they're out of the norm. And that's the reason that that particular lifeline is impacted. Not that it's bad, it's okay. just that their normal operation is impacted. All right, that makes sense. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, the next. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The next uh, lifeline that is in red is food, water, water, and shelter. The the sub element of that is the food supply is in red, because stores are experiencing shortages and limited quantities on certain items, as well as another sub element is the food distribution network. And of course, we're all aware panic buying and hoarding is occurring, and they're not able to keep up with the demand. Now, the reason it's red, an indication that, the, that, we, that it's disrupted, but there's no indication or plan that can be identified is in both of these areas, these are a public se sector operation and that government has limited or actually no capability to provide assistance uh, to impact their uh, supply chain uh, problems. Uh, we could probably assist them later on down the road if we had a, a through other means, but at this particular moment, uh, government doesn't have a solution to the private sector's problem in this area. Questions about food and water? Now, what I have to also describe is there are, there are probably seven or eight other sub elements within that uh, that are in the green. Uh, so I'm not I'm not discussing what those those are like public water system, just water distribution, private residence, public shelters, different thing. Those are all green. So, uh, so that it doesn't roll up into the red. The uh, next area is health and medical, and that's in red. And the only reason that's in red is because of the subsection called public health. The fact that we're in a worldwide pandemic and uh, that there's, the impact is, is uh, regionally uh, with minor impact in uh, uh, us locally. Uh, the other areas of health and medical that are currently in yellow are hospitals and ERs that are experiencing high volume of patients, uh, doctor's offices and medical supplies. And those are in yellow because there are, are actually plans in place to try to deal with that particular impact. Whereas public health, uh, I don't, I know I'm good, but I don't have a, a answer to how I can fix this pandemic. Any questions on uh, health and medical? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Norbert. Uh, Kurt, Larry Nordvig again. Yes. Um, yes, sir. Without giving away any company name uh, for proprietary information reasons, um, telemed, can you touch on that at all? Would, you know, you just discussed the high volume that hospitals are experiencing. Of course, Powhatan doesn't have a hospital. We've got some doctor's offices, et cetera. Um, but for this, do you think just off the top of your head, that telemed, which is becoming quite popular in the news lately, um, do you think that could help ease the situation for Powhatan residents in the area of high volume and maybe bring us back down into the yellow in, in a local well, I, I have looked into, into that uh, particular product and I would say, Mr. Nordvig, that that is really a decision based on a, a private physician or a doctor to prescribe or recommend telemed that uh, uh, as far as government is concerned, or at least in my perspective, uh, uh, that particular service is not something that um, a local government is in a place or should be providing. Okay, thanks. Any other questions on health and medical? The, um, uh, the next one is energy and all, all of the uh, lifelines are in green. Uh, and so there's no impact of this to our energy uh, distribution or sources or, or 
The next one is uh, communications. And there are three areas in communications that turns it into yellow. One is external internet access. Uh, we have limited coverage in rural areas uh, to internet, uh, which is impacting some of the work at home capabilities that we're trying to accomplish by having employees or offices and key staff working from home. Those that live out in the western part of the, the county have are experiencing problems getting uh, internet access into it. Um, IT is working on it, and they've made uh, uh, great strides in, in improving there. But there is some limited areas with limited internet access. We're, we're all very familiar with that. Uh, in also in communications, it's yellow is uh, under social media. And um, the only reason that it's yellow is, is the, the high volume of having to post information uh, daily on our uh, social media uh, accounts. And then the last one, financial services. Um, and it's, it's kind of weird. People ask why is financial services in the communications lifeline? And that's because all our money is done over the Internet and done electronically. So it really is a communications product. If uh, in this particular reason that it's yellow is banks are closed except for drive-throughs, so uh, that is an interruption to the to their financial services capabilities. Any other uh, any questions on communications? Um, the last two sections that are uh, uh, that I watch are transportation and hazardous materials, and both of them are in green because there's no impact in those particular areas. <clears throat> Moving on, I'd like to uh, uh, give you a quick rundown on activities and response that emergency management and the planning section of the EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, and I apologize for acronyms, that's the, the world I live in, so if I use an acronym and you don't know what it is, please, please stop. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Emergency Operations Center was activated a planning group, and it's made up of, of key departments and agencies that most uh, offices are closed, as you're aware, modified schedule. Schools are closed, remainder of the academic year. Uh, admin is closed uh, to some to limited degrees. Uh, departments are making plans for possible staff impact. Today, the EOC asked the, uh, the three, what I call the three main public safety uh, entities, fire and rescue, sheriff, and communications to evaluate their uh, and build a staffing plan for if there was an impact to their areas of 10 to 25% of loss of staff is how would they operate? What would they change? What would they do? What impact would that have on their ability to do service? And so those three entities I'm sure are working on that plan and uh, we'll get back to us on that. Uh, public safety departments are have some adjustments in their uh, response protocol specifically and how they handle certain calls, which ones they do by phone uh, and uh, uh, I think the fire chief, if he's going to be on today, could could describe that as well. Um, under outstanding issues or challenges to uh, the county from an emergency management perspective, uh, pretty much uh, lack of sufficient quantities of uh, personal protective equipment for what we call non-public safety departments uh, that interact with the public. Uh, I was able to get my hands on some masks and gloves. Um, I'm not gonna tell you about supplier. You know, I think his middle name is Guido, but uh, I managed to get a hold of some supply sources of, ma of surgical masks and some gloves and got them in the hands of social services and uh, some other entities as, as well. Um, we also are challenged with managing what I call the message within our media and social media um, uh, outlets. We need to make sure that our, and it is challenging to try to make sure that the message is uh, consistent and on track and is speaking from one voice. Uh, our PIO, Bridget, is doing an excellent job in posting information uh, uh, when she's requested to, and we're monitoring all the social media sites and posting as, as necessary. Um, another issue or challenge is supporting the telework and uh, network access IT equipment. Uh, it was considerable effort in the first week or so to get uh, that out, and uh, IT was able to do an, a, a yeoman's job in, in getting the equipment out, as well as schools was able to get a lot of equipment out. And we did that in a collaborative fashion between uh, county IT and school IT and making sure that everybody had connections on there. 
the next slide uh, is what we anticipate as the priority and the actions that we'll do over the next week or coming weeks as we continue to watch this situation grow is we'll continue to monitor the situation in the county. Uh, we'll continue to provide field uh, support to field incident commanders. This is the is, is the emergency operations center is doing this for that. Um, we'll continue to develop uh, what what I think is is very effective situational awareness and and a common operating picture. We want everybody to know what's going on and all sing off the same sheet of music. We're going to develop some contingency plans for possible impacts to critical and essential county staff. Uh, functions and people. We're going to be very proactive down the road in managing and producing and the distribution of public information message. I think that you, if you haven't heard, uh, you saw the the press release on the AM radio station that I was able to get uh, from VDOT. And it's not the best station in the world, but it's putting messages out. And my plan is to change those messages once a week. And so I'll be uh, putting up a new a round of different messages up there um, including some that are, are, are in Spanish. Um, seek uh, sources for PPE and sanitizing products. For, uh, uh, every day I'm, I'm, I'm talking with the state and other, other people to see uh, where we can get stuff uh, and, if, um, and if there are better places to go for, to get that. And uh, last priorities for next week, and I've already started uh, having a conversation with um, the schools on this today. And we'll have a conversation with Public Works uh, later on in this week is to implement an expense tracking system for use with the public assistance program. Uh, FEMA has already declared a, a national disaster on this and the public assistance program has been activated. And so what that means is we'll be collecting uh, information about what we've spent so far going all the way back up into uh, January and February. And I'll be submitting that uh, through their FEMA grants public assistance portal uh, and try to go after every, every penny and dime that I can get in reimbursement. But I, I do want to caution you that not to expect that this money will come back to us in any speed. Uh, this is an unprecedented public assistance program where all the states have been declared and all the counties and cities and towns in Virginia have been declared eligible to apply for assistance, including private nonprofits, if they if they meet certain criteria. Um, and I think, uh, in my opinion, it's going to it's going to overwhelm the FEMA system in the public assistance area. And it's just going to take a long time to process the forms and the paperwork and the request for assistance. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's not um, years before we actually see anything coming back. So I wouldn't I wouldn't plan on seeing money coming back from FEMA um, to impact uh, this next budget or even the one after that. And, and I think lastly on this slide, I wanted just to remind you because I've, I wasn't able to share this with, with all the board members, but, uh, but this is the leader's intent and this is your policy goal statement to me uh, from, from the board. And uh, these are the goals that I'm uh, attempting and uh, to accomplish and I'd like to go through them um, conduct all planning and cooperation and operations in a collaborative fashion you would like me to ensure that all departments agencies and partners involved have situational awareness and a common operating picture uh, you want me to develop short and long-term plans that address all critical lifeline elements and components and you want me to address gaps or shortfalls in critical resources supplies or services are there any questions on those goals? I guess my question to you, Mr. Chairman, is does this still reflect your intent as a, as a leader and, and guidance to me as far as what you'd like me to accomplish? Yes, but having said that, Kurt, you know, I think it's important to hear from other board members and um, this is an opportunity for them to pitch in if they've got other things that they think needs to be added to this list. And if not tonight, well, I'm sure we're going to have opportunities if we go forward to bring forward other goals or intentions of the board. So board members, if, if you have anything that you would like to append to Kurt's list, either tonight, tomorrow, in the future, please share that. And Kurt, you'll have it just as soon as possible. 
That's all I had, Mr. Chairman. If there's any questions, I'm here for you, and I'll stay with the rest of the meeting in case something does come up later on. Okay. Questions from the board for Mr. Nellis. I've got one, Mr. Chairman. Please, please, Mr. Norman. Actually, um, Mr. Lashney, can you hear me? Is he on? <laughs> I'm here. I'm sorry. I was trying to find the unmute button. Yes. No problem. <laughs> hey, um, Kurt Nellis brought up the stores, you know, the hoarding, and uh, we get whatever paper towels, toilet paper, hand sanitizer in, and about an hour later, the shelf is empty again until the next morning, and that's so common. Um, now I've seen stores take the initiative where they say limit one item per customer, and that's helped a little bit. Um, but here in Powhatan is what I'm interested in, and this is a legal question, Tom. We have declared an emergency. We do have some, uh, as I stated earlier, some police powers, and I'm wondering, uh, I, I tread very lightly on businesses, but are we allowed in any way, shape or form in the future to control, ration, um, determine how much of a product that a business can sell per customer and actually have it on a sign on a shelf that says, you know, by order of or ordinance such and such or Virginia code, you know, if it's a state thing. Um, I remember that being done in another country where I was based while I was in the Navy. I was wondering if that's even a remote possibility here in Powhatan. Um, I, I don't think that we have that authority. Being a Dillon rule state, that isn't something that, that the state has given us that breadth of, of authority. So I, 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 would, I would be hard pressed to come up with a way to support such an ordinance legally. Okay, that answered that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Kurt? Kurt, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done over the last several weeks. I think all of us agree these weeks have felt like years, and it seems like every day is a 12-hour day, never-ending. But again, I want you to know how much we appreciate you and your team. And by the way, your team is constantly meeting so people know you, you have your Monday morning meetings then you have your conference call with everybody else in the world. So we appreciate your steadfastness, your leadership, and we appreciate what you're doing with this emergency operation plan, which is a good plan. We're following the plan. And I want the public to know that the plan is working today and it's gonna to continue to work for the citizens of this county going forward. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next on the agenda, we have Phil, our fire chief. Welcome. Good evening, sir. How are y'all board members tonight? So uh, far, so good. So far, so good. I just wanted to thank Kurt for all the hard work he's done in the last two or three weeks. Uh, we, uh, Powhatan wouldn't be in the place it is right now without him. Amen. He's an invaluable resource. Uh, and he, in, in, in essence, he is a, one of our part-time employees, but he's a He's got so much knowledge, skill, and ability in the emergency management field. We're really lucky to have him. As far as the fire rescue department goes, it's mostly business as usual for us with very few exceptions. One of the things that impacts residents or they might see more than anything else is our response to non-life-threatening emergencies. We still respond to them, but we're not gonna send first responders to them. We're gonna send transport units only. So that's our biggest impact that the public will see from us. And then obviously the public may see us in, in some personal protective equipment when we enter our home, just to, to protect ourselves and protect them from us. And so, so those are the only two major issues that you, any of the public may see from us. Uh, we also work with the 911 center, Tom Nolan's team, Cindy Gillespie on questioning the 911 callers to make sure we have good quality information to give to our responders for potential uh, uh, exposures to our responders. So uh, we've got that down very well right now. And we also work with the region. So the questions are very generic throughout the region. And, and uh, so if wherever you're at, you, you hear the same, the same <clears throat> questioning. Uh, a couple of other things that uh, just want you to know about is that the mental and physical health of our responders, whether they're volunteer, career, or contract, 
is uh, it's very high where we've, you know, we we're all pretty anxious when this started and, it, and all the information that came out, but everybody's settling down now, getting into a good routine. And that's one of the things I really stress to our responders and, and providers throughout the county is, is try to keep it as business as usual. So uh, we, we continue to work hard and, and we're gonna address problems as they come. And then probably the hot topic button that we hear throughout the country is personal protective equipment. Powhatan, we're really well stocked right now currently and our use or our burn rate is pretty low right now. So uh, we feel comfortable for the next month and we are continually working with the EMS suppliers to continue to bring in more personal protective equipment. So we'll be able, in it for the long run. So any questions for the fire and rescue department? Board? Of course. <laughs> Mr. Norvick. Of course I have a question. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Phil. Um, really good to hear about the health of everybody and the morale seems pretty good. And, um, and I tell you what, you're, you all are worth your weight in gold. At times like this is when you really find it out. PPEs, your personal protection gear. Um, okay, we're good for a month. but we Easily. Just, easily. Easily. We just heard from the governor, <clears throat> pardon me, June 10th. So that's where he's thinking this is going, and that's more than a month. And if, if I hope not, but if this accelerates, um, right now it's not slowing down. Um, so if a month, month and a half is about right, what can we as a board and what can we county staff board everybody do to make sure you have enough. And you know, do you need something outside the box here? I know you've got your channel. I don't channels. think so, because we're, we're working with, with Kurt and, and we've made a request through the state. We also work with our, our normal suppliers and we're, it's coming in. Okay. It's just not, we might not, when we ask for gloves, we might get a case of gloves versus two cases. Okay. So there, our suppliers are doing a really good job at, and I can see that steady, uh, I know production has ramped up considerably where we're seeing that it's coming in. So I feel comfortable that we'll be good through the duration. I really That's do. the word I was looking for. Thanks. Okay. Perfect. Good question. Any more questions for Chief Warner? If not, thank you, sir, for all you do for us. Thanks. Thank you, board. Thank you. Sheriff Nunley is here tonight. You're not on the agenda, but I think you were intended to be. So if you would like this opportunity to come share with us, we'd love to have you. We are doing well. We have not had any self quarantines of any of our sheriff's office personnel. Everybody's been able to report to work and uh, done, done real good. We want the community to be comfortable and realize we're still out there safeguarding lives and property and protecting the rights of our citizens. Um, we have not seen a great uptick in any particular types of crime, um, but we do want to make sure people know that we are out all night still patrolling our businesses and making sure that the uh, rules of the road are followed. So we, uh, equipment wise, we're doing real well. Uh, we work very closely with uh, Kurt and Chief uh, Warner. We uh, had nothing but cooperation and nothing but great things to say about Kurt and the emergency uh, operations. So we are doing better than most, to be quite honest. And um, new supplies are coming in. Our vendors have been very supportive. And uh, the men and women that are out there in the field have the equipment they need right now. Any questions for Sheriff Nunley? Sheriff, thank you again for everything you do for us. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Next, we have Mr. Shardine, our acting county administrator. So yeah, before me, we've got Tom Nolan, uh, public communications director. Uh, he'll give us an update on 911 dispatch. Tom, welcome. Hello, sir. Thank you. I'll make this uh, comments quick and right to the point. We have a great team, public safety team, and everybody's been very helpful with the 911. We know that the 911 is critical. And what we have done is we've restricted access to the 911 center, making sure that we use Skype and other technologies as we are doing tonight. Um, we can't say enough about keeping this place clean. And Ramona has had this place professionally clean. And we are 
adding additional cleaning duties with our cells and are doing our wipe downs, if not twice a day, three times a day. All the consideration for auxiliary staffing, we looked at retired uh, deputies and firefighters who have 9-1 experience, and they, we are providing them some additional training on how to handle non-emergency calls. We're doing a caller process, as uh, Chief Warner mentioned, in which we're asking COVID-19 questions, but the, the important part is that we're not delaying any response and it went in response to the dispatching of those emergency service providers. We also put out an announcement announcing the same, that what well, the questions we're asking is not going to delay in any way the dispatching and the processing of those calls. Otherwise, call volume has been moderate. Uh, overall, the callers that have been calling, we are entering quite a few more calls that are administrative calls that enter into some type of service for the sheriff's office and or the fire department to take in consideration how they want to handle it. Otherwise, I'm just here for any questions. Any questions for Tom? Seeing none, Tom, again, thank you for, you know, the outstanding that you do, job you do in the communications center. We, we're all very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chardon, are you on now? Yeah, uh, now, so I'll just give a quick uh, update on county administration um, and some of the things that the others uh, hadn't touched on yet. One, Kurt had mentioned the emergency operations plan. Uh, I think it's important to mention that that's not, you know, something that's uh, years old and collected dust that we had to pull off. Um, but you as a board actually adopted an updated version in January. Um, so that seems kind of fortuitous that, you know, we have a good, fresh, updated plan that we're all uh, familiar with, uh, which was helpful. Um, so thanks to Kurt for, for leaving that before we really knew we were going to need it so quickly. Um, as far as county administration, uh, the term we're using is open with reduced operations, and we'll be under that until future notice. Um, and it depends department by department, but for the most part, that means that the offices are closed um, by appointment only. We're doing things remotely. A lot of the staff is working remotely to limit uh, the public's exposure and our staff's exposure. Um, and on the county website, we have a COVID-19 page where you can go and see more detail on uh, the status of various departments. Um, as far as how uh, Kurt and I and administration are staying up to date and getting the latest information on this emergency, uh, we're regularly monitoring the news from world, national, state, local, social media. Uh, we're in regular daily, if not hourly, contact with Virginia Department of Health and Virginia Department of Emergency Management. Uh, we view all of the, the governor's three times a week briefings. And then I have twice a week a standing call with all of the county administrators and county managers in the region so we can compare notes uh, and learn from each other and you know, understand what other localities are doing. Um, then we have a weekly call with our local planning team. Uh, so that's key staff to go over uh, our operations here locally, including uh, Virginia Department of Health, Emergency Management, Sheriff's Office, 911 Dispatch, Schools, Fire and Rescue, Public Works, Social Services, Economic Development, Human Resources, and IT. And then uh, also starting today, have a weekly update call that's open to all county staff um, to kind of talk about what's changed uh, since the last week and look forward to the upcoming week. Uh, so we have a good call today. We had, uh, I believe, 67 employees take part in that call. Um, so just an effort to keep everybody up to date and, and make sure if there's any issues, uh, we're aware of them. And then regular meetings and communication with a, a regional entity that we're part of, the Central Virginia All Hazards Incident Management Team, or CVA HIMT. That's made up of Powhatan, Goochland, Chesterfield, Henrico, Hanover, and the City of Richmond. So we can share information uh, and planning efforts regionally. And we're also monitoring uh, what the impacts to our local economy are of this. Um, ultimately, what, what this will end up being is unknown, but unemployment claims are certainly up and we hear from businesses and people that, that are struggling. Um, some are doing okay right now. So we'll keep an eye on the, the state and federal assistance and what's available to our businesses and our citizens. Uh, Roxanne and our economic development office put together a, a summary of the status of all of the restaurants in Powhatan who's closed, who's doing to go, uh, who has pickup, things like that. And 
say thanks to the, the public and helping us make sure that's updated. Um, she did a good job, but you know, the public was able to uh, chip in and offer some more thoughts on and corrections on a couple of those things. Uh, Roxanne and Economic Development has also put out a survey to our businesses locally to find out what issues they're experiencing and what kind of aid or assistance they could use at a local level. Uh, so we'll update you as we get more information from the business community on that. And then uh, also for our businesses on our economic development website, which is yespowatan, Y-E-S powatan.com. Now at the top, we have a COVID tab that has a list of resources available for businesses. Um, and then if any business has an issue or question or suggestion, uh, also yespowatan.com has our contact information. And Roxanne Salerno, our economic development program manager, would be the uh, best resource for, for any business issues right now. Um, so that's kind of a summary of where we are this week in county administration. Let me know if you have any questions. Any questions for Brett at this time? Thank you, Brett. I would like just to make a few comments. So you'll know, Brett and I talk every morning and then we talk every evening at the close of the day and then several times in between, it seems like. Brett's done an outstanding job and keeping us informed and getting out information down to the board, down to the departments, communicating with Kurt, communicating with the folks in the county. He's done an exceptional job and I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank him for everything he's done because he's not working eight hours a day. I'll give you an example. You know, he's calling me at night. We're having conversations on Sunday afternoons. So, this job has morphed into something other than an eight to five job. And I appreciate, and I know the board appreciates everything that you've done to facilitate us. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Glad to do it. And uh, it's only possible because we've got a great team here. Um, you know, it takes a lot of people to do this. So thank you to all of our staff as well. that have definitely stepped up. At this time, we have our public comment period. Anybody wishing to come forward, please give your name, your address. If you're an individual, please limit your comments to three minutes. If you're representing a group, we will provide you with five minutes. John, where are we right now with the people? Has anybody called in? Illness is on the right side of the screen. Brett will, uh, Brett, can you queue them up if you'd like? Okay, Brett, would you tee them up for us? And again, I remind people, if you're calling in, please give your name, your address, and please limit your comments to three minutes. Brett? Yeah, um, so just a quick summary. Uh, John Wood, our IT director, he's prepared a, a number of options. Uh, one, we had people could email any comments to be read into the record if they couldn't take part in this call. Um, checked, it doesn't look like we have any right now. Um, people can also call in, um, so I'll, I'll do that one last, but I'll call on the uh, last four digits of your number if you wish to speak to identify you. And then if you're taking uh, this call or this meeting on uh, Zoom or on your computer, you can raise your hand um, virtually. So down um, on one part of the screen, there should be a raise hand icon, or if you're not seeing it, click participants. And then hopefully that will show up. You can click that and we'll look and see who on the side has their hand raised and we'll, uh, we'll <clears throat> call on you then. Um, and if anybody, this is our first time doing this. We've done a couple test runs, but the first time, um, you know, live with the public. So if anybody's having trouble um, and you aren't able to get through to us, um, but you have a question or something that you want to make sure is answered, uh, just give me an email um, or a call afterwards. Uh, the email address is administration at powhatanva.gov. Again, administration at powhatanva.gov uh, or phone number is 804-598-3639, 804-598-3639. We'll make sure you get your uh, question answered. Uh, so looking now, um, yeah, of our attendees are showing, I don't see anybody with their hand raised. Um, we do have one caller um, listening in. I'm not sure if they wish to participate. That phone number ends in 5053. Um, John, if you want to bring them on and see if they wish to speak. Is anybody there? 
Brent, we, we're not getting a response. Yeah, so they might just be uh, using the phone to uh, listen in, which was an option, um, particularly okay. for people that might have uh, not have broadband or access to stream the meeting. So. Okay, so it doesn't appear we have anybody that wishes to comment this public comment period. No, and we will have one again at the end of the meeting. So uh, if anybody wants to, they can then as well. Actually, we see, uh, looks like Mr. Blackman has I raised his hand. Yeah. So John, can you bring him on? Brad, it looks like um, Mr. Barley noticed that a hand went up at the top of the screen. Can you see that? Is that a hand? It's <laughs> Mr. Blackman, his hand was raised. Yeah, I saw Mr. Yes, Blackman's hand went up. And Yes, he's there. Okay, good. Okay, good. I'm here. I had a question for what options are there for children who please, are- Please give your name and your address, your name sir. And your address, sir. Yes, my name is Alan Blackman at 1918 Judesbury Road, Powertown, Virginia. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. I had a question for what options are available for children that are being homeschooled for the duration of the year that have no access to internet? I have three grandchildren, grandchildren that have no internet access at all, and all of their homeschooling is being done by uh, supposedly internet access. I'm searching for options now, but it looks like it's going to cost me a few hundred dollars a month to be able to provide Verizon wireless form is my only option. Are there any programs or available things out there for them to help out with this situation? Sir, we don't comment or we don't respond back during public comment, but what we will do is have staff get back with you. And if there's any information that we can garner to assist you with that, we'll be getting back with Brett. Would you do that for us? Would you assist this gentleman with any information in his pursuit to be able to get broadband? Yes, either um, if Mr. Blackman wants to uh, either give me a call so I have his number or send me an email. Uh, so that way I have his information to get in touch with him. Uh, be glad to follow up. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Brett, do you see anybody else? No. Okay, this time I'm going to close our first public hearing. Now at this time, Mr. Viley, we have our consent agenda and I believe you've got an, an issue with one of the items on the consent agenda, but I'm going to go ahead and make the motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion, Mr. Viley? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, under the uh, approval of the January 27th, 2020 regular board of supervisors meeting minutes, um, it's on page 16 in our booklet. <clears throat> Mr. Viley, uh, would you like to make a substitute motion to pull that off of the agenda for discussion? Because you, you want to change, yes. yep. change what's in that. I, I, I got it. I'm just trying to figure out what rules we're going to work on tonight. Yes, I would like to make a motion Don't work to under remove Robert's 8A rules. from the consent agenda and move it to uh, maybe Mr. Chardin or you. We will move it, to, move it to 9A. 9A or 9B? 9, 9A, be fine. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion, a substitute motion to vote on. I will second the motion. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. That's, been, that's been pulled off to 9A. Now I would like to entertain a motion to go ahead and approve the consent agenda as amended. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we'll now move to 9A, discussion on the uh, minutes. Uh, I believe, Mr. Farley, it was the January 27, 2020 regular board of supervisors meeting minutes. Yes, sir. We finally Thanks. got there, Mr. Barley. I, that, I, you actually jumped through the hoops rather well, I thought. It would eventually come around to it. Um, the, the, what I have in the book shows that we voted um, determination of interim county administrator stipend was voted 5-0 motion passed. And I think that that vote is incorrect. I think that vote was a three to two vote, Mr. Chairman. And I'd just like the minutes to reflect the correct vote. 
Ms. <clears throat> Barley, your, your memory is correct. Staff, would you please go back and correct that and show the recorded vote? And yeah, we'll do that. And I apologize for that error. We uh, <clears throat> caught that after the packet had published. Um, so, sorry. Well, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you quite at the last. But no, I was just saying we, uh, we caught the error after the packet had already published. So uh, just apologizing for that. Okay. So you'll bring it back to us with the corrected version next meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Farley. Thank you. All right. Old business, um, budget considerations in response to local emergency, Brett. Yeah, so just wanted to give you all an update. Obviously, uh, you know, this health crisis has also become an economic crisis. Um, so we're continuing to monitor the, the impacts on county budget. Uh, as far as revenue goes, people aren't spending as much as they usually would. So sales tax is likely to go down. Um, that does only make a, a small part of our budget. So that's not as big of an impact. The, the biggest impact is likely to be if we experience high unemployment, especially extended unemployment for a, a long period, we'd likely see reductions in the collection rate of our real estate and personal property tax, which make up the biggest percentage of our budget. Um, we're also monitoring the impacts to expenditures from responding to this crisis. Uh, some departments are, are spending more, um, but a lot of them are also spending less as, as we do less. Um, so we'll continue to monitor those and see what the uh, overall expenditure changes are. Um, we'll also continue to monitor the state and federal aid um, to see what can be made up as far as some of that funding. Uh, we'll need to adopt the school's budget uh, on time. Currently, there's been no uh, state um, extension to any of these budget deadlines. Um, or fiscal year. So we'll uh, move to adopt the school's budget separate of the county budget. Um, so later in this agenda, I'll ask you uh, for approval to advertise the school's budget um, to stay on the deadline of adopting that in early May. Uh, then we can push adoption of the county side of that budget um, as late as possible up to June 29th. Because uh, every day that goes by, we, we know more and have more information than the day before. So uh, you know, no need to rush to adopting a budget when if we did one you know, next week or in two weeks, it would change the week after that. Um, right now, we don't have any numbers, but we're running um, you know, a number of different scenarios on the revenues and expenditures. I think it's safe to assume that we'll have less revenue in the last quarter of this current fiscal year, um, and we'll have less revenue than expected going into the next fiscal year uh, starting July 1. So in response to that, uh, working with Charlotte Schubert, finance director to look at some of the different scenarios. You know, if, if this happens, how do we accommodate uh, that there? We've also uh, worked hard to make sure all of our staff are tracking and monitoring um, their time and spending related to this, uh, because a lot of that will be reimbursable, uh, as Kurt said. So the more we can document it and the more we can get reimbursed, the less we have to make up um, on our end. We've asked staff to uh, limit spending uh, only to essential services and products. Um, we've temporarily put on hold hiring and filling new positions. Uh, worked with Ramona Carter, Director of Public Works, to push out any non-essential capital projects to future years or some of those projects that were already under work that might have been in the design phase to stop there and not move forward with construction. Um, so working with that. And then asked our employees and department directors just to look for opportunities for efficiencies and, and savings, um, which is something we always do, but just extra emphasis now, but we're a pretty lean organization, a pretty fiscally conservative county. Um, so that's something that's always in our mind when we're developing our budgets. But you know, this, this causes us to go back and look and see where else additional savings can be made. Um, so Charla and I will be uh, continuing to work on that and, and keep you informed uh, as we bring uh, revised budget proposals for you to you. Thank you, Mr. Chardon. Any questions from Mr. Chardon? Yes, Mr. Chairman, Bill Cox. Mr. Cox, welcome. Can, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Brett, a couple of things that uh, you might want to consider. Uh, first, on the sales tax side, impacting our 2020 budget, not our 2021 budget. And talking with Mr. Timberlake, we'll see approximately a 90-day lag in, in 
uh, sales tax. So we won't see what's happening today until sometime in June. The other thing is, as you know, we get 5.3% on general sales tax. We get 2.5% for food and essential items. In both of those categories, we get a 1% rebate from the, um, from the state. While people are spending less, they're certainly not spending less on food. And so uh, we will see some changes in income from both the Food Lion as well as Walmart. Jamie can run those uh, by account. So as we move down this path, he should be able to give you a much better idea of kind of the mix and flow and how it's going to impact it. But it looks like the major impact is going to be in our 2021 budget. As far as real estate, uh, I know uh, Faith probably has some numbers and she can look at what's going to happen in 20, for our 2020 June payment, which is already out there. But I would guess that a significant portion uh, of our real estate uh, is being paid uh, and by escrow. And that will get paid. There'll be no delay in that. So as we can take a look at, we have the ability to take a look at what escrow does for us, what that leaves uh, left over, where we can really get impacted. So just I'm, you know, drilling down a little bit, there's some more information I think out there uh, that as you move forward, we'll be able to help you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Cock, thank you. Those are those are the kind of comments that I would like to see the board direct to staff as they go forward gathering information. So please, you know, as Brett and Charla are putting out information about the budget, about what they see are the major building blocks and with their advice as to how we go forward, please ask them to provide you with the type of information that Mr. Cox has shared with us tonight. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And uh, yeah, Nicole, I said, Charles and I are working on it. Um, I should definitely also mention that our treasurer, Faye Barton, and Commissioner of Revenue, Jamie Timberlake, also, they've been uh, really helping us get that information so we can analyze this and make some of the best decisions going forward. So thank you to them as well. Okay. Brett, thank you and Charlotte for what you're doing. Okay. Next, we'll move on to. <clears throat> uh, New business. We have a resolution R2020 16 fixing the calendar year 2020 personal property tax rates. Mrs. Carmack, gentlemen, we have before you the proposed rates. Is there any discussion? If not, I move to approve the proposed rates as presented. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any comments on the motion, Mr. Norvin? I think it would be um, for the public's benefit to let them know that this rate rarely moves. I think the last time this rate moved, uh, Mr. Byerly, you were in the mid 80s. Yeah, mid 80s. <clears throat> the Old Testament. Exactly. So um, this is not something typically that the board moves like we do, you know, real estate tax each year. So uh, I, I think everybody's pretty set on where the rate is. And we, we certainly wouldn't want to raise it at a time like this. So uh, I'm good. Okay. Okay, would you call the roll, Brett? Mr. Nordvig. Aye. Mr. Byerly. Aye. Mr. Cox. Aye. Mrs. Carmack. Aye. Mr. Williams. Aye. Ordinance passes. Next, we have authorization to advertise the publication of the FY 2021 school budget. Brett, I'd like for you to weigh in and give us a little background on where we are with this. Yep, so uh, as I said, the school budget has to be adopted earlier than the county side of the budget, uh, mid-May. Um, so this is just asking for your authorization to advertise the budget because we're required to hold a public hearing on it. Um, because of the timing, the school board will actually officially adopt their budget recommendation tomorrow. Uh, so what we're asking to advertise is the superintendent's original budget proposal, uh, which in speaking with them understand it is what the school board's likely to recommend approval of tomorrow um, as is. Um, but we're in regular communication with the schools and the superintendent. Um, so any changes to that budget that happened before the April 27th public hearing 
uh, we'll, we'll update you on. And also if we get a revised budget before then, we can advertise what that actual budget is. This, this advertised budget would essentially just be a not to exceed amount. Um, once you advertise the budget, you could always adopt something lesser than that um, in May. So. So I think that's the key point. This is advertising a budget and you've had the discussions with Dr. Jones, I know, where this can change because again, we're in a very fluid situation where things change every day. So as we go forward, any, when we get to the point where we have to do the transfer at the beginning of May to the schools, there are other options if we need to, if, to get more information, for example, we can transfer over that part of the budget for salaries so that they can do contracts. Is that correct? Correct. That, that's right. So <clears throat> the emphasis again, we're advertising, but this hasn't been adopted and all of us are on the same, uh, same understanding that this can change based on circumstances going forward and what, you know, we adopt as a final budget. Okay. Any questions? Brett, do we need to vote on this authorization? Or yeah. We um, just have consensus that we're you know, going forward. Um, I, I think County Attorney could weigh in, but I'm fine if you all just give me a, a voice vote that you're okay with it. Mr. Chairman, I do have- Yeah, that's fine. That's all you need. Go ahead, Mr. Norvig. Hey, uh, Brett, it's Larry Norvig. Hey, a um, couple things. Where can citizens, if we're gonna advertise a budget where can citizens find the budget online? And since we are in a situation where online is um, challenged, shall we say, where can they find it on paper if they want it? Yeah, so uh, the superintendent's draft budget is, uh, I believe on the school's side of the uh, website. I'll, I'll check with Charlotte and make sure if it's not, we get it on the uh, county finance website as well. Um, and then once we find out uh, for sure what the school board adopts tomorrow, we'll, we'll get that put up there as well. Uh, typically, we would keep a hard copy of the budget in the county administration office there on the front counter. Um, with the building being closed, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll talk with Charlotte and see how we um, get one out. We also would often put a copy in the library. But the libraries are closed. That's not going to work as well. Um, so let me, let me talk with Charlotte. It's a good question about how we get a physical copy out into the community that people can have. Um, otherwise, if anybody has a question about it, um, again, just give me a call or email um, and we can, we can make sure they get a copy, whether that's dropping it in the mail to them or, or whatever, we'll make sure they, they get it in hand. Okay. And um, it, does it make sense to have a copy that people can call in advance and say, hey, I'd like to come up and spend 30 minutes looking at the school budget copy? Can they come in and do that in admin or conference room or something in the admin building? Is that something possible? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We should be able to set something like that up. And I'll, I'll talk with Dr. Jones as well and see um, on their side what they're able to offer. Well, and the reason I ask it, this is all about transparency. This is the reason that we have a requirement to advertise is so that people know what we're doing and that that uh, we, the people, our boss collectively can, can chime in. Um, they have to be well informed if they're going to be able to, you know, ask intelligent questions of public comments or or send us emails or whatever. It's an important part of the process. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, if you'll indulge me <clears throat> for a second, this is the biggest um, basically bag of money that we deal with is the school side. It's more than 50% of our county budget. So, um, and there's a lot of parents, um, teachers, staff, students. There's a lot of people in this county that have an interest in what the schools are doing. And we're, we're looking at massive, massive change because much of March, all of April, all of May, um, the portion of June that would normally be in the school year has just been wiped away. And it raises a lot of questions and I'm not gonna go through an exhaustive list. I will be looking at line items in that budget very carefully, but just things come to the top of my head. For example, um, you know, we're not having to pay fuel for buses. We're not having to pay for substitute teachers. We're not having to pay to, to uh, chalk the sports fields and maintain the, uh, you know, the, the spring sporting fields like we would have. Uh, we don't have any activity buses running around. We're using less electricity. Um, the cafeteria looks much different than it would have. 
So all of these things and many, many more are going to change the equation for this fiscal year. And then it raises the question, how does that impact any sort of rollover credit considerations for the next fiscal year, which is what this budget addresses. So th there's just a lot of questions out there. I've, I've had only a couple calls to be honest so far, but um, I, I think we're gonna get heightened interest as this rolls along in the next 30 days or so. So I really would like the people to be able to access the latest and greatest school budget that they can. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Norbert. Mr. Brad, Mr. Chairman. You, excuse, Mr. Me, Chairman. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Cox. Yes. Could, Please. Um, what we're talking about advertising is the 2021 budget. I um, Ms. Nordvig, you have raised a, a lot of interesting and, and, and pertinent questions, but that doesn't impact, I don't believe, what the citizens will be looking at. What you're addressing are the impact on the 2020 budget. Am I correct about that? Well, as I said, I know it's this budget is 2021. I realize that. We are getting a major impact in this year, fiscal year budget. So the question arises, what happens to the money that we're not spending right now? Um, and I know that there's protocol. I know there's some um, you know, capital maintenance reserve type protocol. We got a line item in our budget for what happens with excess funds. But this is a very, very unusual year. And we're under emergency act. Um, I, I think this discussion will be more than just business as usual. As I said a few weeks ago, it, if we're looking at this as a normal budget year, we're looking at it wrong. This is completely out of the ballpark for what we've experienced in the past. So uh, we're talking about a lot of money and what's gonna happen with the current money, I think would impact decisions we make for the new fiscal year. That was my point. Brent, I think you've got your marching orders. I think what we would like to see is more dialogue coming back from the school as to what are the impacts on the 2020 budget as Mr. Norvik and Mr. Cox have agreed that's where we're gonna see the impact and then going forward, what do we plan for in 2021? Now, you always plan for the worst and hope for the best. Now, do I know whether the kids are gonna be going back to school in September? Heck no. But I have to plan and that's the reason we chose as a board to put off adopting a budget for as late as we could because I for one see better looking in the rear view mirror than I do looking forward at this time. So I want as much information as I could get my arms around about what the different scenarios look like for the schools in 2021 as well as the county so that I can resource that budget appropriately. And again, I don't know whether distance learning costs more. I don't know whether it costs less than having the kids enrolled next September. Those are the types of things that we depend on the schools to provide us as inputs into the budget. And Brad, I'm sure you and Sharla are having those types of discussions with Larry Johns, Dr. Jones, uh, the school board. And so we will have that information at some point going forward when we need it for our decision making. Any other questions of the board members? Okay. so. Mr. Lashnell pined that yes, we can have consensus to go forward. So my understanding is we do have consensus unless I hear otherwise to go forward with advertising. All right, we will now move to our second public comment period. I will open the public comment period. If, if you would like to speak, call in, please give your name, your address, Please limit your comments to three minutes. If you're speaking for a group, we will give you five minutes. Brett, what does it look so, like? Uh, yeah, again, I'll, I'll just remind everybody, if you do wish to speak now um, and you're listening, you're watching it, um, click the raise hand icon. I won't see any yet. We do have one additional phone number listed here. Uh, it's ending in 8538. Um, so John, if you wanna bring them on, we can see if they wish to speak or if they're just uh, listening in by audio.
Do we have somebody that wishes to speak? Doesn't appear we do, Brett. Okay, yeah, I'm not seeing anything and I haven't gotten any emailed comments uh, while we've been meeting. Okay. All right, so if we don't have anybody that wishes to speak and we haven't received any emails, then I will close the second public hearing. County attorney comments. Um, only comment I have, Mr. Chairman, is a props to our IT folks for this going very flawlessly and smoothly. Uh, I think they did an impressive job of pulling this off. And that's all my comments. Thank you, Tom. You stole my thunder. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. They, um, John and his staff deserve a lot of credit, folks. We came together very quick to get this done. You know, the Hollywood Squares. Uh, we talked among ourselves, you know, to whether or not, you know, we were going to be successful this evening. Uh, John Wood and his staff, they deserve a lot of credit again for getting this done. And congratulations. It looks like we're going to make it. John's giving me the thumbs up. Um, county administrator comments, Brett. Yep. Um, first, meant to say this earlier, but uh, excuse my kind of business casual dress. I uh, had gotten into my suit and tie for you all, and I'm holed up in a corner of the house away from the kids to keep the noise down, and it's like 80 degrees in here, so that <laughs> suit was was not going to work for long, uh, so I switched into my official uh, Powhatan County polo. Um, the next meeting you all have, uh, we have next week, April 9th, uh, on hold as a, uh, intended as a budget workshop. Um, so we'll, um, if it's okay with you all, we'll, we'll hold that and plan on meeting. We'll work on the agenda this week. And again, each day that goes by, we have more information um, on the budget. And by that time, we'll have the school's official recommendation from the school board. And I imagine they'll be having some good discussion there tomorrow night. Um, so again, let us keep uh, April 9th on your calendar for our next meeting. Um, beyond that, you have April 27th as your next regular meeting. I um, also wanted to just thank uh, Echo, thanking John Wood, our IT director, and uh, his whole team in the IT department. Um, he's done a great job pulling this off. And thanks for everybody that helped us uh, with some of the test meetings of, of running this throughout the week to make sure it would work. Um, and again, if anybody was trying to comment and couldn't get through, again, give me a call or email. We'll make sure your question gets followed up on. Um, and then lastly, just want to thank all of our staff and all of our citizens. You know, a lot of people, everybody's been sacrificing right now and doing their best to help get us through this as quickly as possible. Um, so it's, it's great to see people stepping up and uh, coming together. That's all I have tonight. So Brad, you're going to keep us informed as we go into the week in terms of your recommendation, Charlotte's recommendation about the meeting on April 9th? Yeah, that's Getting right. Scheduled right now? Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, board comments, Mr. Mr. Nord. Um, for the citizen that mentioned in the first public comment period about homeschooling and, and uh, resources, et cetera, um, my family homeschooled for over 20 years. I've got three kids and uh, we've done public school, private school and homeschool. So we uh, were familiar with the newness of it and kind of the um, the difficulties as well as the blessings that come with that. So I, I'm going to make an offer. If anybody out there is really struggling with the homeschooling part, uh, I'd like to make myself available. You can find me on the website, email or call. Um, my wife is more than willing, I'm sure, to also speak with you. I also know that our teachers are not, they haven't disappeared. They are still a wonderful support group. I know uh, many are mailing out packets for the younger ones and are available remotely for other students. So you've got that too. Um, that's my first comment. And then my second one is um, don't go out unless you have to. Uh, I know it, cabin fever strikes hard, but we are allowed to go outside and take walks. We are allowed to ride a bike or go for a jog you are allowed to go to a state park. They are open on purpose for people to do that. Just keep your distancing, um, keep your distance in the stores. This little virus is pretty aggressive and fairly contagious it looks like. And you heard Dr. Samuel talk about it a bit, but um, 
you know, we have to count on the people of this community to not be selfish. And I think this community is very tight and we have this in our favor. Uh, I think it's a wonderful group of people out here in Powhatan. So we're counting on you to do the right thing and uh, keep everybody safe and healthy. So <clears throat> just follow the protocol and we'll be okay. Wash your hands. Thank you, Mr. Norbert. Ms. Bowley, would you like to share um, any comments? No, I think Mr. Nordvig did a great job of explaining, you know, what our concerns are with the county and how we need everybody to work together as a team. I mean, it, it needs to be everybody in uh, Powhatan is known for being a team. Yep. Ms. Carmack? No, sir. Mr. Cox? I'm just delighted with what Mr. Nellis and Chief Warner and Brett, Sheriff Nunley, Tom Nolan have done for us. Uh, we're in a difficult world, obviously, uh, and it's very comforting uh, to be surrounded by people that are uh, operating at the level that they are. So big, big thank you to them again, and uh, they're making our life not easy, but easier. Thank you, Mr. Cox. I'd just like to say that, you know, once again, thank Brett, his team, thank all of our employees in the county, and once again, Kurt, for, you know, the great job he's doing. And just as importantly, I want you to know that you've got a good board of supervisors. They're working as a team, working with staff. We've got a good plan. As I said before, we're going to follow that plan, and we're going to get through this. Thank you. With that, I'm going to join this regular meeting. Good night.